Welcome to our webinar, Processing of a Twin Data Set in Chrysalis Pro and Solving the Structure in Olex 2. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Joe Ferrara, um, CSO of Regaco Americas Corporation. And I'd like to introduce your host, Pierre Lemagores, Director of Scientific Support, who will be going through a data set start to finish uh, showing you how to handle a simple twin problem. Um, before we get started, I would like to run a poll to see how you use or what your role in your lab is. Uh, first, are you the PI of the lab? Are you the X-ray facility manager? Or are you an undergrad or graduate student? So I'm gonna launch the poll. We'll give you about 30 seconds to answer and um, then I'll post the results. So it looks like most of you are graduate students, certainly the majority, a few PIs, and uh, about a third are x-ray facility managers. So it looks like about 77% of you voted. We'll give it about five more seconds. There's still uh, 17 of you that haven't voted. All right. I'm going to close the poll and we'll share the results. And the majority of you, slim majority, are undergraduate students. A third of you are facility managers and the rest of you are PIs of the lab. Thank you. Pierre? Yes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good crowd today from all over the world, actually, it looks like. So good afternoon to those of you in, the, in North America, uh, good evening in Europe, and good morning in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So we are glad that you could take the time to join us today, and I'm sure hope that you are all uh, healthy and, and safe. So I'm going to start now the, this session. For that, I will first turn off my video okay. and get going now. And I'm going to start by reminding you that this is a series of webinars that we have started since the beginning of April. Uh, on April 3rd, my colleague, Mark Del Campo, already ran a webinar on how to process protein data in Chrysalis Pro. Last week, uh, our software manager, Matthias Meyer, gave a more general uh, presentation about Chrysalis Pro. If you have not attended these, uh, these past webinars, you can uh, go back to them by uh, linking with the uh, Rigaku homepage, and then from support, go to past webinars, and you will find a video and audio recording of each one of these uh, webinars. For upcoming webinars, then select here uh, the upcoming webinars option, and you will see uh, those webinars that are uh, up and coming, and you can register to those that uh, you find uh, to your interest. So as I just said, uh, so this webinar will be recorded, but also the data set that I will use now uh, in this session will be provided to you afterwards. Okay? Uh, you are welcome to ask all the questions you may have during the session. So this will be done uh, in writing though. If you uh, bring your cursor to the bottom of the uh, Zoom interface, you will find a Q&A button click on that button and write your question. That question will go to Joe and they will be submitted back to me at the end of the session. Uh, so, uh, and so I'll try to answer some of them. Uh, so there are almost a hundred attendees right now. So if each of you asks a question, I think I'm in big trouble at the end here, but uh, no worries, uh, those questions that I can't uh, answer today, uh, I will answer uh, them and send them back, send my reply uh, to you guys uh, within the next few days. No worries there. We also uh, like to remind uh, people that we have a Rigaku X-ray forum that you can register to and uh, take part into uh, crystallography uh, conversations with our community of users. So on to the data set. So this was a data set collected a few years ago on a benchtop X-ray diffractometer called the STX-MIDI. That, that system was the first ever benchtop. 
it ran a fine, focu uh, fine focus Molly seal tube and worked with a CCD. So just for your information, that system has been since then replaced by the Crystal Lab Mini, which is an even smaller uh, benchtop system. You can see its dimensions here, and it's also a more performance system, uh, among others, because it is uh, configured with the latest te uh, detector technology, a hybrid photon counting detector, the Hypix 3000 from, uh, from Regalgo. So this latest detector technology is even better than the CCD uh, technology because it has a higher sensitivity and it creates almost zero electronic noise. So higher sensitivity, almost no noise, obviously your, uh, the eye of the sigma statistics of your reflections uh, will be much, much greater. The data set was actually collected by my friend here, Eric Reinheimer, when he was an adjunct professor at California State University. Uh, since then, Eric has joined the ranks of Rigaku and is now part of our sales force as the Western Regional Account Manager for a single crystal. So Eric collected on that crystal uh, you know, in three scans, each scan being made of 180 images and one degree oscillation per image. The diffraction images were made of two exposures, each of 35 seconds, and all together it amounted of uh, to 12 hours of data collection. So there is for, here it is for the introduction. Let me now uh, minimize my uh, window here and we'll get going with um, uh, opening Crystalis Pro and uh, starting to play with the, uh, with the data set. So to open that experiment in Crystalis Pro, I traveled first to my data directory, which is called twin TTF for me here. And then I looked for the PAR file for that specific experiment, the PAR file being like a database file that uh, contains all the, uh, information for that, uh, uh, for that experiment. So that uh, at any time later on, you can double click on that profile and reopen the uh, experiment in Crystalis Pro at the very uh, level that you left it off last time you, you closed Crystalis Pro. So I just double click on the profile and the Crystalis Pro interface opens up. The Crystalis Pro interface is organized as follows. So you have a series of executive tabs on the right hand side. Crystal uh, is for everything that deals with uh, ind indexing. The data collection tab here shows a summary of uh, uh, the data collection parameters if the data set has been collected with Crystalis Pro as well. Uh, so the, as for the, the data reduction, the, um, uh, that tab will be populated with uh, uh, data scaling or scaling um, statistics once uh, the data reduction uh, is completed. On the left hand side, there is a series of so-called power buttons and we'll go through a few of those uh, today. And the bottom uh, gathers all the features uh, that um, allows you to control the appearance of the, the diffraction image on the, in the main interface of Crystalis Pro. So this is what my diffraction, uh, my first diffraction image uh, looks like. Uh, here, uh, you may want to adjust the zoom level via this plus minus button here so that you have a full view of your diffraction image on, in the main interface of Crystalis Pro. Uh, you may want also to adjust the contrast from the uh, Starburst um, button here, more precisely going to the pull down menu that is beside it, and you can choose a, a contrast level that you like for, um, for your image. Uh, you can also uh, choose a different color scheme from the button that uh, shows a paintbrush uh, the pull down menu here will give you access to different color schemes. Some of you may be uh, used to the hot metal uh, color scheme, for instance, but we also like either seismic, sorry, seismic is this one, and uh, Saturn. So, um, I mean, personally, I like these two because they allow me to see the weaker reflections at higher resolution here uh, better. So now, uh, once the uh, display of the image is adjusted, I always, always like to play the, the data set as a movie at once. And that's, I use this button here at the, at the bottom left, uh, just left click on it and watch the uh, whole data set being uh, played as a movie. That allows me within just a few seconds to see if data collection went well through the end or whether something happened during data collection, something like uh, the appearance of ice features or maybe the diffraction intensities uh, going down, which would mean or could mean that either the crystal moved or um, suffered from radiation damage. But in any case here, that data set was fine uh, throughout. All right, now 
let's jump into the uh, data processing of this data set. First thing to do is to create a mask that will properly hide the beam stop shadow here so that the program doesn't try to integrate data that are behind the shadow. So to do that, we'll uh, open our first power tool here, the command window. And from the command window, click on the options button, move that new dialog out of the way if need be. And from the dialog, uh, select the beam stop mask. This is the interface used to um, design the proper beam stop mask uh, for, uh, for the shadow of that beam stop. First thing I'm gonna do is actually display the beam stop mask and that's what it looks like at the moment. Obviously it needs to be adjusted. Its size um, needs to be adjusted as well as its positioning because you see that if I turn the mask on enough, see that it actually does not co uh, coincide with the, the shadow. That shadow is slightly tilted to the left and I will need to take care of that uh, as well. So uh, the first thing to do is to actually select the type of, of beam stop mask that you want to use. The, the one that is selected right now is the is the top one, so that's why the mask uh, comes from the, from the top and is straight down, basically. So uh, to, I can also choose you know, to give you a few examples. Here, here is a mask that comes from the left at 45 degrees. Here is a mask that comes from the bottom or a mask with a dual cup um, a beam, beam stop, basically. So if I go back to top again, I, want, I told you that I need to take care first of the tilt angle, slightly tilted to the left, but the angle parameter is not uh, available to me at the moment. To make it available, I will actually travel uh, to the user type of mask. And now the, the angle parameter becomes available. I just left click on it and implement a little tilt angle there. Uh, in here, uh, three degrees to the left is just good enough. So I need to adjust the size of the central cup as well. And that's what I do through the diameter button here. Left click on it and implement a, a wider uh, diameter. 1.5 seems to be hiding the entire uh, shadow from the from the cup. And I need to make the, the arm here a bit thinner though. And the, the width of that arm is controlled by the holder diameter parameter here. So left click on it. And from 1.5, maybe I'll put it to 1.1. Let's see what we've got here. And there it is, so that's pretty good. Uh, you also have an X offset and a Y offset uh, so that you can move the mask that you have just created uh, sideways as, as well as uh, up and down. So once you're happy with what, what you've done, save what you just did uh, to the PAR file so that the next time you, that you open up that experiment in Chrysalis Pro, you don't have to do again what you just did. Chrysalis Pro basically will remember that mask that you just created. So I can now click OK and then close the, the command window. All right, step number two now, let's try and index that diffraction pattern. For that, I will go to the second power uh, tool, uh, the bottom, uh, the bottom at, here, the bottom at, at the top left uh, corner of the, of the interface, which is called the lattice wizard. And here I will do a pig hunting and unit cell finding, and then we'll jump to the reciprocal space to see what our diffraction pattern looks like. So pick hunting, just using your default, nothing, nothing more than that. And here, uh, Chrysalis Pro gathers all the, uh, the strongest uh, reflections throughout the entire data set. And it's telling me that it's found 4,327 reflections. Then I jumped straight ahead to uh, unit cell finding. And so Chrysalis Pro tells me that it found a unit cell parameters with those uh, dimensions, about seven and a half, 7.7 .7 and 11.2 angstroms. The three angles follow, and you see that the three angles are all uh, different from 90 degrees. Uh, and so that's why uh, the, uh, or that's consistent with the primitive triclinic uh, crystal lattice here. So AP stands for primitive triclinic. However, we see right away that we've got only 62% of the diffraction uh, reflections indexed. So maybe we just need some more refinement. However, even if I click on that refine instrument model button, nothing happens here. Uh, I can't get more, any more reflections indexed. So obviously I've got the problem. Now is a good time therefore to go look at our diffraction pattern in the reciprocal space. And you do that by opening the eWorld Explorer via this button here. So that's what our um, uh, diffraction pattern looks like in the reciprocal space. Let me just for now reduce the size of the, these reflections. I'll come back to that anyway. 
So um, in the reciprocal space here, the dots represent the reflections and the grid represents the lattice calculated from these unit cell parameters and displayed in the uh, reciprocal space. So with the left mouse, you can uh, click and rotate at will but the best way to look at the reciprocal space is to uh, uh, display the whole thing along one of these uh, three reciprocal space axes, A star, B star, and C star. And here C star is basically perpendicular to the plane of the, uh, of, of the screen. Okay, so here, uh, and in, uh, successful indexing uh, will, will show that the reflections uh, almost all the reflections coincide with the uh, crossing points on that grid and those crossing points are also called lattice points. So besides a few, very few reflections here that are not on those lattice points, uh, the vast majority of the rest is um, uh, ex exactly on lattice points. So everything is fine in that orientation. The problem is when I look at the lattice in a different orientation and then I see that uh, there are a lot of additional reflections in between the lattice points along that specific direction here, which is C star, okay? So this is along that direction that we've got, uh, we've got a problem. So was our indexing wrong? Well, then to, do, to check that, let's look only at the reflections that were indexed. To do that, so I will go to the table at the bottom right of the interface. And so that table tells me that there are 2,700 reflections indexed and 1,600 wrong meaning unindexed. So let me turn off the display of the unindexed reflections. That's what I do from this little box here and untick that box. And so now I can see uh, only the, uh, the indexed reflections. And suddenly here in that, even in that orientation, I see that those indexed reflections all coincide perfectly with the lattice points. And that's true along A star, B star, and C star. And so that strongly suggests that uh, our indexing was correct. So those unicell parameters found upon indexing are probably uh, correct. The problem is that if I bring back into the display the unindexed reflections, so we just have additional reflections that are not accounted for yet. And altogether, we have about 38% that are not accounted for yet. We just have multiple diffraction patterns, and we don't know how many yet, how many more we have. So why, uh, where do these uh, multi multiple diffraction patterns come from? You have several reasons. Of course, it can be a, a twinned crystal, which is the case here, but it can also be uh, a multi-crystal. And a multi-crystal can be that, you know, when you uh, mounted your crystal into the, the loop, as another crystal came with it. Maybe it was smaller and you didn't see it, but now instead of having one crystal in your, in your loop, you've got two, and therefore you will have two diffraction patterns as well. Another possibility is that you did mount only one crystal, but that crystal was cracked. So the visible light may not have told you that the that, uh, crystal was cracked. You didn't see it under the microscope, but the X-ray light is telling, is telling you that it is cracked, okay? Two other possibilities uh, is that, are that something may have happened during data collection. So maybe your crystal moved and therefore uh, a different crystal orientation will give rise to a different diffraction pattern. Lastly, the, uh, your crystal might have cracked also during data collection under the stress of the cryo temperature. So you see here that you, you may have things that happen during data collection or uh, problems that may have been there from the beginning of your data set. So there is a really nice feature from the reciprocal space viewer here uh, in the filters tab. So if you expand the filters tab here and switch on the run feature, that feature allows you to display the data set one scan at a time. And uh, whenever I have multiple diffraction patterns, I'll always look at, the, at, at this one first. Uh, so once you uh, have ticked that box here and, and enabled the uh, feature, uh, click on none to remove everything from the display and then switch the display back on, but only for scan number one. And here you see that that issue, whatever it is, uh, was there from the beginning. So that means that for this, this crystal, uh, the, the problem was uh, intrinsic to the crystal. It was there at the beginning of the data collection. Nothing, it's not like nothing happened or something that happened during data collection. All right, so now that we've established that, let me bring everything back into the uh, display by pushing the select all button. And I'm going back to the crystal tab here. 
So now it's time to try and see if we can uh, index that additional diffraction pattern as a twin or a multi-crystal. This is uh, basically the same feature here in Crystallis Pro. So left click on that blue link and then select automatic twin finding. For many of your twin cases, that automatic twin finding uh, feature will, uh, will work just fine. So indeed, let me click on that. And uh, Crystallis Pro did find a second lattice here. And so on the right hand side, uh, Crystallis Pro came up with a component number two. The unit cell parameters for the second lattice are um, displayed here and you see that they are basically the same as the parameters for the first lattice. Oftentimes it is as such in, in uh, uh, twin crystals. It doesn't have to be, sometimes it, it isn't, but many times uh, the, the, the multiple lattices actually have the same unit cell parameters. Good, so the next a very important uh, number uh, to look at is how many reflections were actually indexed by that second lattice. So here I've got 35.4% of the reflections um, indexed, which is almost the entire set of reflections that were not previously indexed by the first, uh, uh, in the first lattice. And that leaves us only with 2% of unindexed reflections, okay? So that 35.4% reflections index is really good. Obviously this is a significant, the second component is a significant significant component to our whole crystal. Um, now, if that percentage uh, number uh, is much smaller, well, uh, maybe uh, it is, that second component is so small that uh, it may not be worth taking into account for processing your data set. So oftentimes I propose a rule of thumb of below or above 10%. Uh, if I say, if I see 10% or less, I'm prepared to disregard uh, altogether that second component. If it is more than 10%, well, maybe indeed it is significant and I will definitely try to process my data set as a twin component. The next thing to look at is the, the, those numbers here in, the, in that panel. So the, that panel shows the twin law. And our twin law here is an 80, uh, 180 degrees rotation along the reciprocal direction zero, zero, 001. So 180 degrees, along the 001 direction. These are exact numbers, which is a strong indication that our crystal is a twin. If it was a cracked crystal, obviously the crack would, be, uh, would have a random orientation in the crystal, and therefore those two sets of numbers would probably be random as well. Okay, so basically this is the main part um, uh, in your handling of a twin data set. Hopefully Crystallis Pro uh, will basically take care of it uh, many times, uh, in many cases for you. So at this point, this is okay to close uh, the reciprocal space viewer. Uh, for those of you who are already more uh, experienced in Crystallis Pro, let me spend a little bit more time here to show you how to play with the graphics here and maybe display uh, each uh, lattice separately. So to do that, I'm going back to the, the table at the bottom here of the interface. Uh, the wrong reflections are the unindexed reflections, 2% here. And so I can turn them off from the display because they are no longer interesting to us. And then the, the three other numbers represent the separated reflections for the first uh, component, the separated reflections for the second component, and then the overlapped uh, reflections. So let's look at the, the reflections from the first component first. So I'm turning off the display of the overlap and of the reflections coming from the second component. And then I'm also going to turn off the display of the second lattice. And to do that under component number two, I left click on that blue link overlay off. Okay. And so now I'm looking at the, at the reflections from the first component on top uh, of uh, the, the first lattice. So now since we have much less uh, reflections, I can increase their size. And to do that, I go to that button at the top here, the GUI settings button, left click on it. And I choose to display the size of the reflections according to their intensity, F of I. So now the size of these spheres is proportional to the intensity of the reflections. So you can see very well now along A star, B star and C star, how well all those reflections from the first component coincide very well with the latest points of the first lattice. On top of that, I can now turn the display of the overlap reflections uh, back on. But of course, they, they overlap and they are current, currently displayed with the same color, so it's hard to tell. So, 
to display them with a different color, I will uh, move those overlapped reflections to a different group, let's say group number two here, so that they will be displayed with a different color. Okay, so to do that, I will leave only those overlapped reflections as visible and I turn off the display of the, uh, the reflections from the first components. So only the overlapped reflections are visible now. I go back to the filters tab and I use the feature move visible to, and then I can choose whichever group I wish here from the pull down menu. Group two is fine. I click on move visible to, and now the overlap reflections have come down here and they are delivered with, um, displayed with a different color. So now that this, uh, I have this, this view, I can switch the display of the uh, separated reflections from the first component back on. And so now you see two sets of, of uh, colors on the, among those reflections. So you can see better how those uh, separated reflections overlap with those overlap, uh, overlapping uh, reflections. Again, along A star, B star, and C star. So now let's do the same with the reflections from the second component. I will turn uh, the, off the display for everything, the overlap reflections, the re reflection from the first component, and going back to crystal here, the display of the first lattice. So now I've got nothing displayed. I'm turning back on the display of the second lattice and turning back on now the display of the reflections for the second component. And now I choose to uh, a preference, uh, and I mean, a display along the A star axis for the second lattice. And there again, I can see that the, the reflections from the second component overlap really well with the lattice points from the second lattice, confirming that our indexing for the second component was correct. And I can br uh, switch on the display for the overlap reflections as well. And of course here, these overlap reflections will overlap with the lattice points uh, of the second lattice as well, by definition. There, so I wanted to show you these few um, uh, graphics features. So now I will turn, uh, close the reciprocal space uh, viewer for good. Going back to the Lattice Wizard main interface, I can look at the reflection statistics for each one of the components. Uh, the Lattice Wizard tells us or gives us the total number of reflections, the number of separated reflections, and the number of overlap reflections for each component. So now I can close the, the Lattice Wizard as well, and I'm going to jump now to the processing of that data set. To do that, I go, I click on the stop stop button from the top right uh, corner here of the interface and go to data reduction with options. So here we have six steps, six different dialogues. I'm just gonna cruise through them because this is not the point of this webinar here. And I'm just gonna, uh, going to use the defaults of these in these dialogues. I will make two comments though. The first comment is on step number one, the box that switches on the data reduction for a twin or multi-crystal uh, uh, sample uh, is automatically ticked on, okay? Because obviously Crystal Pro remembers or knows what, uh, uh, how to say, uh, sorry, uh, knows what we just did in the Lattice Wizard. So I'm gonna click the next button and go through all the steps all the way to step number six, uh, where I'm gonna do two things. I like here to uh, en uh, enter that, uh, that interface and uh, so as to enter the, either the chemical formula of your compound, if you know about it, or at least what you think the chemical content of your crystal is. That's not really for, for Crystalis Pro, but that will greatly help the structure solution program uh, uh, for a subsequent structure solution. As for the Z number here, the number of molecules per unit cell, we don't know what it is yet because we haven't stopped the structure here. So once you have entered at least the chemical component, push the button here, set mu and formula. And, uh, and so, th so that, th that dialogue is closed. The last thing I'm gonna do here is push that button, change output name. If I will uh, implement my uh, own name for the reflection file I'm about, for the new reflection file I'm about to create now. Otherwise, Crystalis Pro, basically Crystalis Pro not knowing what you want to do with the reflection files, will uh, put the new data into the reflection file that uh, already exists, if any does exist. And so the data 
uh, or the results from the, uh, a previous uh, processing that you may have done will be overwritten. Okay, and so that's because Chrysalis Pro doesn't know what you want to do with your reflection file. So that's why whenever I do a manual processing as such, I always open that dialog and implement uh, my own uh, output uh, reflection file, a uh, name for, for um, the, the reflection file. And of course, uh, for any uh, manual run uh, of data processing you do, uh, you can create a new reflection file. So I'm gonna click OK here. And now I'm ready to run the, um, uh, the whole data processing. So that thing will take a couple of minutes. And uh, while this runs for these two minutes or so, um, we would like to take this opportunity to ask you another question about how you use uh, Chrysalis Pro. Uh, the reason for that is basically Chrysalis Pro can be used for data processing only. That's basically what I'm doing now. And by the way, the processing version of, of Chrysalis Pro is license free and also free of charge. So that means that you can uh, install Chrysalis Pro on as many computers as you wish, and it's free. Uh, but Chrysalis Pro also uh, controls the Rigaku systems and so uh, it can, can be used to collect data. Therefore, we would like to, or we are curious to know how, how you guys are using your version of Chrysalis Pro, data collection, uh, or, just, um, um, uh, or just data processing. Okay, with that, we'll start our second poll. And Pierre uh, mentioned it. Uh, the question is, how are you using Chrysalis Pro? And the answers are, my, app, my lab owns a diffractometer and I use Chrysalis Pro to collect and process my data. I process our data, our X-ray facility manager collects for us. And lastly, my lab does not own a diffractometer. I use Chrysalis Pro to process data collaborators collect for us. And so we'll give this about 40 seconds or so. Um, looks like the lion's share of people are uh, using a diffractometer in their lab and are using Chrysalis Pro to process their own data. Okay. So we're seeing about 75% of the responses. Let's give it a couple more. We have 100 people. Integration's done. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and display the results, which uh, show that 86% of the of our attendees own their own diffractometer and use Crystal's Pro to collect and process the data. Okay. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah, thank you, John. So meanwhile, data processing completed. Uh, as you can see, uh, Crystal's Pro usually goes through a full data set uh, pretty quickly. Uh, now, a few things to look at in the data reduction tab uh, here that now has been populated uh, with a summary of the scaling statistics. First, the reflection statistics. Um, Chris Lispro is telling us that uh, there are about 2,000 ref isolated reflections uh, for each component uh, and about 5,500 uh, reflections from either component, but that overlap with some, something uh, nearby, uh, uh, nearby them. Then uh, the scaling uh, results, scaling statistics are int and i of a sigma for each component. So these two lines here show you that um, the R int is really good for each one of the of the data sets between three and four percent, and the I of a sigma is, uh, is strong for both data sets and really of uh, quite quite similar. Underneath that, you have then the scaling statistics for the merged data set, meaning the reflections from both components put into the same reflection file, and that reflection file will be called the HKL5 file. Now here, uh, the R int is even uh, lower at 1.6% and the I of a sigma higher. So obviously taking uh, in, into account the fact that we had two twin components in, in that crystal uh, in, improved the data. So that shows you what a good job Crystalis Pro did here in deconvoluting the overlapping reflections and coming up with their proper integrated intensity. Now, it's not always like that. Uh, sometimes those statistics will become a bit worse, but you will come into uh, several cases also where the, uh, merging the, the data from both components actually create better results. And all that we, was done in space group P bar one, which was automatically uh, determined by um, Chris Lispo. So now the scaling here uh, that uh, immediately followed uh, um, uh, data processing, uh, was done automatically by, by Chrysalis Pro, right? So now, if you want to play with some of these the scaling parameters and, and to see if you can even further improve these results, that's when you go 
you use another one of our power tools uh, from the button that shows two intertwined lattice or lattices and says twin data finalization. Click on it and you have a new interface with several options uh, that opens up. I'm just going to mention a few of these, uh, uh, of these features here. Uh, Basically, the main thing to, uh, to try probably is to uh, run again scaling by uh, forcing Chrysalis Pro to give a different scale factor to each component. So it's a scale factor is always given to each component of your crystal. And so, of course, your common scales will assign the same one and separate scale will allow Chrysalis Pro to, uh, to assign a different scale factor to each um, uh, component. Now, given that these two components are pretty equivalent in terms of, of strength, uh, diffraction strength, uh, actually choosing one or the other doesn't, doesn't change anything, uh, as I will prove to you right now. But nevertheless, you, you ne never know until you run it. So always try that. Go to separate scale and then, OK, to run another scaling. So here, now Chrysalis Pro asks us whether we are in P1 or P bar 1 because we have, remember, a primitive triclinic lattice. So we know this is P bar 1. And indeed, here in P bar 1, you see that those numbers basically didn't change. But again, you always must uh, try that because you never know how it will, uh, it will uh, respond. So if you want to do some, to run an M, uh, and absorption correction, so you can do empirical absorption correction here and numerical absorption down here. For empirical absorption correction based on the symmetry related reflection, uh, you can open the apps pack uh, dialog here and play with a few more parameters uh, in, this, in this dialog. Among others, I will mention the, apply, the detector correction that you can apply from this box down here or turn off and uh, the, uh, thr the, the spherical harmonics that you can play with here by unchecking that box so you don't, uh, you no longer allow Chrysalis Pro to calculate these, these coefficients automatically. You want to have access to them. So uncheck that box and from these two pull down menus, uh, select the value that you wish for the evens and the same for the odds. And so you can play with the, uh, many of these numbers and run again and see whether this improves the results, meaning lower R int and in increase I of the sigma. Otherwise, uh, check that box again if you are happy letting Chrysalis Pro do its thing. For an absorp uh, a numerical absorption correction, this would be done down here by checking this box, provided that you have done face indexing beforehand. Here, I don't have any crystal pictures because that system didn't take uh, pictures of the crystal before data collection. So therefore, I can't even run the, absorp the numerical absorption correction. But if you have done uh, face indexing, all you have to do is click that box. Uh, in the same vein, if you have done um, uh, face indexing, you can uh, click this other box to apply a spherical absorption correction. And lastly, uh, if you want to run a manual space group search, uh, click on that options button and uh, select run growl in interactive mode. That will open up uh, all the dialogues that allow you to select the, the type of lattice for your crystal the centering of that lattice and ultimately the, uh, the uh, space group. Uh, so otherwise uh, you can, if you uh, select run growl in silent mode, that means that you let Chrysalis Pro do, uh, the, run the space group search automatically. And that's all I'm gonna um, say here for, uh, for scaling. I'm gonna close that, uh, that uh, window and show you where the, uh, the files uh, uh, created by data processing are located. So I go back to File Explorer. And those files basically are all stored in the main experiment directory of Chrysalis Pro. So if I sort my uh, file now, uh, my files by date modified here. And so uh, up here, there is an HKL4 HKL file that has been created. This is the uh, reflection file that contains the reflections from the first component only along with the INS file that will be used for structure solution. And a little bit down here, there it is. There's also an HKL5 dot HKL file, the, uh, the, the reflection file that uh, contains the reflections from both components. So you're welcome to pick up these files and uh, transport them into your favorite structure solution program and go on for, for, uh, with the structure solution. The thing is that if you have OLEX2 uh, installed on your Chrysalis Pro computer, you should have an OLEX2 button here on the left-hand side and clicking on there, 
will allow me to, uh, or should allow you to open OLX2 in the proper directory right away and with the proper file. So here, OLX2 basically is seeing uh, several ins file at the moment and this is the one here that I just created that I want to use to start uh, solving the uh, structure. So then I only click OK and then uh, OLX2 uh, opens up and I'm getting ready for solving that structure. At this point, before I jumped into the very last part of, uh, of my webinar, which will be uh, finalizing the structure, uh, we would like to take that opportunity to ask you one last question about the kind of data that you process with your Crystalis Pro version. So obviously Crystalis Pro um, uh, can handle the data from Rigaku um, uh, detectors, uh, but it can also handle uh, data from non-Rigaku detectors, detectors that you find at the synchrotrons or detectors from other vendors. And so we are curious as to whether you guys have yet uh, processed data that uh, come from non-Rigaku um, uh, detectors and Joe will ask you one last question right now. So I've already posted the poll. Um, looks like about 63% of the people have voted. Um, we'll give it a few more seconds. Um, our compliance rate's been about 80%, so we'll wait just a few more. Um, looks like uh, most of the people are processing data collected on a diff Rigaku diffractometer. And then it's about equal in terms of processing data on detectors, detectors, as well as other vendors. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And you can see it's, it's pretty even, 60% uh, process only on Rigaku detectors. Remember, this is a multiple choice, so we actually have 119% uh, answers here. So thank you very much. And um, Pierre, go ahead. Yep. So the last little sprint here is going to, just going to take me two or three minutes to finish up this uh, this webinar uh, that will deal, I will deal now with the structure solution. So for the sake of time, I have actually solved the structure already here in OLX2, but only to a certain point. Basically, uh, if I open up the pull down menu here, you see that the structure was solved and refined up to this point with the HKL4 file, which is the file that contains the reflections from the first component only. Now, so what I've done up, up, to, up until now is the same as what I would do for a non-twin uh, structure. Uh, so just a, a regular uh, structure solution. The one thing now that you need to do to finalize your structure whenever you have a twinned crystal is the following you must now switch to using the HKL5 reflection file, which is, remember, the reflection file that contains reflections from all the components. So select from that pull down menu, the HKL5 uh, reflection file, then open up the input file that will be used for the next uh, sequence of refinements. So open up the input file by clicking on the button here that has a pencil, go down, browse down a little bit up to you see the HKL comment and make sure that HKL F here is at five. If you don't find it at five, then put, put it at five there. And last, last thing to do in the input file is to add a parameter and that parameter is BASF and it stands for batch scale factor. So that batch scale factor will basically uh, calculate a ratio between the two components. And so uh, you need to, add also a starting value to be refined by um, uh, OLX2 or ShellX. So you might as well start at 0.5. So that suggests a 50-50 mixture of the two, the two twin components. But again, that, that value will be refined anyway. So that's it really. So change to HKL5, a reflection file from the pull down menu here. Make sure that HKL F here is at five and add BISF space 0.5 to your input file. I'm gonna click okay and then go to refine and just refine some more. So far, I had an R1 value of 6.28% and a goodness of fit of 1.106. Uh, so when I refine that now with the, uh, reflect the, the, the merge reflection files, uh, so the R1 for this particular data set dramatically goes down by another 3%. So you see numbers here have become red. So these are the weights that are being given to the uh, data and they are uh, red because the value before 
and after the refinement are far apart, which means that the new values have not properly converged yet. That's why they are shown to you in red. This is just to remind you that you need to run a couple more uh, sets of refinements. So when these two numbers before and after and here before and after are the same or really close enough, they are, they are displayed in green. And so that's when your, your refinements uh, end basically. So the R1 has come down to 3.4%. The goodness of it has come down also to 1.05. The maximum uh, peak here uh, for the residual electron density is down to 0.3 electron per angstrom cube, which means that this is basically all noise and everything that needed to be assigned in the structure has been assigned. I am not missing anything. So this is my final structure here, uh, just to show you what it is actually. So at the moment I have two half uh, molecules uh, so to build the entire uh, molecules from the command line at the bottom of the interface, type grow, G-R-O-W, and then return. And OLEX2 will apply this, the symmetry elements pertaining to that specific space group, which is a center of inversion for uh, P bar one space group. And so as to build the other half of the, of the, of the molecules. And that's our final um, structure, basically. Uh, so this is a charge transfer complex between an electron rich molecule, a TTF derivative at the top, and then an electron poor molecule here uh, made up by a tetracyanoquinone uh, molecule. And you have uh, interactions between the two. And that's, how, that's what is called a charge transfer complex. And I'm going to um, stop here. Uh, as I said, so yeah, sorry, I took a bit longer than the half hour, but I, th I thought I needed to go through all, all these details with you. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I maybe I have the time to answer a few questions now. Thank you, Pierre. So we have a few questions. Um, Stephen asks, should we do an instrument refinement for twins prior to closing the lattice wizard? Uh, say that again, Joe, please. Should we do instrument refinement for twins prior to closing the lattice wizard? You, that actually depends as to whether your data set has been collected on a Rigaku uh, system or not. If it has been indeed collected on a Rigaku system, um, uh, Chrysalis Pro is always already aware of all of your exact instrument model. You know, all these little offset for the, uh, the drg beam position, the detector distance. It's all, uh, Chrysalis Pro knows all about it uh, because a calibration has been done on your system uh, with a test crystal. So basically, uh, if you click uh, 100 times on, uh, or if you try to refine your unit cell 100 times, it's not gonna go anywhere because those offsets uh, have already been taken into account. However, the answer is yes, if that uh, data set comes from a, a different system uh, of which Crucialis Pro doesn't know the offsets and they, then uh, unit cell refinement um, for a twin or a regular data set will be useful. Okay, our next question comes from Miguel. Is it possible to know if you have a twin crystal by just looking at the diffraction spots? Sometimes. Uh, so in this case here, let me go through the, uh, through the images one by one using that button here. So by the way, this button makes me jump to the next image. The next button over makes me jump uh, by 10 images at a time. And then the next button over makes me jump to the first image of the next scan. And that's forward motion. And then this is backward motion here. So if I jump to the to, uh, by one image at a time, uh, so in, you see when you see such split uh, uh, reflections like this one here, those ones there, and uh, probably up here also maybe. Uh, so this is usually an indication that uh, so you have a multi crystal, be it a twin. Or, or again, a cracked crystal. Remember, you can have a cracked crystal also. Uh, but it's not oftentimes not telling enough. You, you suppose that you, have, you may have a twin. It's not, uh, it's not always uh, for sure. And the best way, anyway, to analyze your diffraction pattern is always, always, always looking at it in the recipro reciprocal uh, space. When I train uh, people, I tell them, always look at your reciprocal space, always. Okay, so our next question is, is it, is it possible to get a unit cell, in parenthesis, we can use later from the Latticet tool? Uh, yes, uh, so 
basically once you have a unit cell here if i understand the question properly you can uh, you can save it from uh, from this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, feature here save save parameter and so on and so uh, and then load it back uh, afterwards for to try to index another another pattern i think that's what is being asked here okay and i think the next question um i'm it says, uh, why HKLF5 and not HKLF5? Does it matter if you use the, put the BASF after the HKLF5? So maybe, it may, maybe it's why HKLF4, not HKLF5? So yeah, the, because uh, this is only with HKLF5 that you import or that, that you include the data from the second component also. So uh, I suppose then, yes, uh, that's why you should uh, add that BASF uh, at that moment when you are actually refining the structure by bringing the reflection from the second components. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise, as if you were refining your structure with a, a, a really clean crystal and the, that BASF factor will not, uh, will not have a proper refinement. Okay, so um, we have a couple questions that are related. Um, one is, why does rint now say NA? Um, why is the rint not visible at the end? Why is rint after HKLF5 inclusion in yep. OLX2? So um, all three are related. Okay, I'm sorry, I do not know and I do not control that. This is more uh, a question for uh, the OLX2 authors, I suppose. Uh, okay. And, uh, and I, admittedly, I never bothered asking them and, and therefore I admit that I don't know. But this is, uh, this is a, a, something due to the OLX2 interface. It's not like there is anything wrong or anything, right? Um, uh, in, with, in the same token, uh, many people uh, have uh, asked me why the completeness here uh, for any kind of data set, be it a twin uh, data set or not, why sometimes the completeness here is lower than the completeness reported by the data processing program. This is because uh, OLX2 reports the anomalous completeness before the Friedel pairs are merged. And therefore, sometimes that completeness here will be uh, 96, 97, 98 percent, right? So this is the way the OLX2 interface reports statistics, which, which is different from uh, uh, the way that Chrysalis Pro and many other data, data processing programs uh, uh, report statistics. So therefore, this is more of an OLX2 question. Sorry. Um, okay, so uh, next question is, uh, this is great. Can we also make an OLX webinar? Um, uh, maybe I'll answer that one for you, Pierre. Yes. If you go to YouTube, you will find a large number of pre-made uh, videos by Horace Pushman that provide a lot of uh, insight into the various features of OLX2. Um, our next question is, in OLX, when switching from HKLF4 to HKLF5, if the WR2 gets worse after refinement, does this mean twin refinement is not correct? Uh, so you, you shouldn't look only at the WR2. Uh, so there's the R1 and the goodness of it uh, to look at as well. Uh, the, uh, the maximum residual electron density peak here, do these numbers uh, go down? Uh, or the absolute values here for these two numbers, do they converge closer to zero or do they go up? So you have to take all these uh, statistics into account really to, to check as to whether your twin refinements uh, uh, improved actually the, the data or, or, or made it worse. So not, I don't think that you should look only at the WR2. Joe, do you, you have an, an opinion about that? I would um, agree with that. Uh, you should look at the other parameters, including goodness of fit, um, size of your peaks and you know it's it's not you shouldn't base your uh, final answer on a single number it's right a bigger picture and so if you see things going a bit uh, a bit wrong here or a bit worse remember also to go to info and bad reflections because you see uh, you may have a few bad reflections to to reject uh, which will 
improve uh, usually some of, of these of these parameters that maybe look may look a bit suspicious to you. For instance, it could be that the R1 went down, but the goodness of it for some reason went up a little. I've, I found that sometimes this is because you have a few bad reflections to uh, to get rid of, and that goodness of it should then uh, become um, I mean get lower and, and, and improve. So. Uh, info, bad reflections, and check as to whether you have a few bad reflections to maybe reject here as well. Okay, so um, let's see. We have a question from Patrick. Is twin processing shown here the same for dealing with a mirahedral twin? No. Uh, so, uh, crystallis pro, it's, it's in theory, this is impossible to deal with, um, um, or it's really hard to deal with mirahedral twin because. Uh, when you look at a diffraction pattern uh, from a mirohedral twin, be it in the, uh, on your diffraction image or in the reciprocal space, so th the reflections will be exactly on top of each other all the time, okay? And so uh, it's actually, I, I don't, I've never done it in Crystalis Pro, okay? However, uh, if you want to check as to whether you have a mirror, mirohedral twin, the best thing to do uh, is to, at, you, at the end of your uh, refinements, uh, in OLX2, uh, open up the input file from that uh, pencil button again, and add the following. So add twin, and then uh, the, uh, the same BISF parameter I entered uh, for this session, for this webinar before, uh, do the same for to check as to whether you have a, a, a mirror hill twin. So as soon as you do that, uh, you see the program automatically implement an, an inversion twin, uh, and we'll try to ref, uh, refine the structure, taking into account that you may have that mirror hydro twin. Okay, and then what you do is indeed again look at those uh, uh, statistics like the the R factors, goodness of fit, and the, the, the residual electron uh, electron density. So that's my way of dealing with that. I usually don't do that in Crystalis Pro, uh, but here if uh, if one of my colleagues know better about how to handle that in Crystalis Pro, uh, then we'll let you know. Okay, so we have uh, another qu uh, another comment. Um, it looks like Shell XT misassigned the uh, ni the nitrogen atoms in the in the phenyl ring. Well, not it's not a phenyl ring. Yeah, but, um, here you're right. Yep. good catch. Uh, so uh, uh, that was from G Gianata Gianta. Thank you. Uh, okay, and that's totally uh, you're totally right. And so, but. This is, um, that happens even with good data set that happens very often because you only have one electron difference between nitrogen and carbons. And so oftentimes uh, the, the all structure solution programs, even a, a super good one like, like a Shell XT will uh, um, get confused as to whether you have a carbon, a nitrogen or an oxygen uh, atom. And that's when uh, knowing your structure comes into handy. And here indeed, since I know these two should be carbon, I can click on them, select both of them. Uh, actually, you know what? So this is the build, uh, the, the, con the full, fully constructed structure. So I need to come back to the um, asymmetric unit first. To do that from the, pool, uh, the common line at the bottom, I type fuse. So I'm back to the content of the asymmetric unit only. And so uh, here, that um, nitrogen is indeed a carbon. So I select it and I push here under tool, uh, toolbox work, I push the C uh, button for carbon and that becomes a carbon now and I can refine it again now as carbon, okay? So yeah, I, I, I left the twin, the inversion twin in my previous uh, input file. That's why it's complaining. But to change the label um, or the ID of, a, of, a, of an item, that's what you do. And there's nothing wrong with sometimes Shell XT mixing up carbons with versus nitrogen or, or uh, oxygen. All right, thank you. So we have two more uh, questions. Well, one, one, two questions, one comment. Um, a comment from Kristen Gerb, uh, one of our colleagues at the yes. office in Frankfurt. He says that very likely within the next day, he'll post a data processing for a mirrorhedral twin. Yeah, Christian and I were talking about that just yesterday, yes. Thank you, Christian. And then, um, then we have a question from Damien. What, kind of scaling factors, common or separate, can you recommend for twin data finalization for mirahedrally twinned crystals with most of reflections overlapped? Well, if it's mirahedrally twinned, all reflections are overlapped. Yeah. So maybe we can defer that to Christian Gerb's session. Yeah. 
So uh, again, so uh, shell XL will calculate a, um, a scale factor uh, between the two the two components uh, via that BISF uh, parameter here anyway. But uh, we'll see what Christian can come up with uh, for the same in in uh, Chrysalis Pro, if anything. And, and I would venture to say um, that it, since in mirahedral twins reflections are perfectly overlapped yes um there is no comet or separate scaling in that sense anyway all right um so then we have a question about that and so if you have questions about the webinar when the next one is you have to go to our website www.ragaku.com let me show that to, again yeah. go to support and yeah. um upcoming webinars. And the last question um, came in as you were switching, uh, as you were going from Chrysalis Pro to um, OLX2. And the question was, I was thinking that you should use HKLF5. And I think the context here was that you want to solve your structure with HKLF4 file, um, which with only one component. Yes. and then use the HKLF5 file for the final refinement. Yes. And that came from Cynthia. So um, I think that's all the questions. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us and be safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.